Um, Nest Box monitoring tools. Here is the uh, two compartment bag that uh, Georgette uses for nest box monitoring. You can also use a day pack, a tool belt, or fishing vest that can be used to carry your tools. And here are some safety items that you can bring to make your nest box monitoring a little bit safer. A hat, a cell phone for GPS, a walking stick, water, a first aid kit, insect spray, snacks, and a compass. Obviously use discretion. I have no idea where your trail is or if it's in a little city park near your house or you, you may not need some of this stuff. If, if it is, I mean, you may not need any of it. If it is uh, half a mile into an open space preserve, I'd recommend seriously considering bringing all of it. Now, these items may come in handy. A cell phone that can be used to record data. For example, I actually have gotten into the habit of recording a video where I give myself what I found in the last three nest boxes. Then I'll do the same after the following three. And then when I get home, I just go ahead and play all the videos and put it all on a spreadsheet. You can use scratch paper or print out one of the forms from our website. Don't forget a couple of pens or pencils. If you like the screen idea, obviously you can put that on your list. And if you are using hanging boxes, your list has got to include some kind of lifter retriever, whether it is the hook style or the basket style. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a little while. Now I have a slotted and a Phillips screwdriver here, and there's actually a good reason for that. Now you never know when you have to pry something open or um, and I always recommend having Phillips screwdrivers in case a screw needs to be tightened or you use them to open up your nest box and secure it. And putty knives or paint scrapers are really good for scraping those old nests out of the box. And uh, pliers are another one of those tools that rescue you when you can't get your box open and you don't want to go all the way back to the car to search for something else, something to help. Scissors are good for, um, you, you never know when you're going to need to cut, like I said, horse hair or, or um, various things. Uh, things often come up and scissors are another uh, item that it's good to just have along with you. Uh, brushes are good to have when you're dealing with those old dusty nest boxes, uh, nests, inside the box. So it gets pretty bad in there and it's nice to be able to just go ahead and use the brush to, to um, scrape it out. And dental or mechanics mirrors are good to have because some of the nests can be hard to see into. Mirrors that can be put in the box and allow you to count eggs are useful. Uh, and a cloth or a handkerchief. Now, one of Georgette's tricks is to use her screen in conjunction with stuffing cloth into the entrance hole to make sure that none of the nestlings come jumping out of your nest box as a pre-fledge. This is a trick she got from Don Yoder. And gloves, rubber or cloth or leather are all good to have when cleaning out nest boxes. And the, here are a few more good things to have. Yeah, we've used masks on the trail long before COVID. They are good, they are good to have along when cleaning out those dusty nest boxes. You don't want to inhale anything. And diatomaceous earth is a tool to combat ants. Though it looks like powder, it actually has the consistency of broken glass as far as ants are concerned. Use it carefully. Don't use it where it could come in contact with the babies because it could irritate their skin. But diatomaceous earth may have the advantage over another ant-fighting ant tool called Tanglefoot. Um, the product shown up here is a bit better than Tanglefoot, which is similar to grease. You could put it on the pole to prevent ants from crossing it, but you need to avoid the possibility of getting it inadvertently on the birds. Get Tanglefoot on feathers and you will regret it. And the birds regret it even more. The Tangle Trap stuff that I'm showing here is better than Tanglefoot 
but it is no less a problem for the birds if you're not careful. Let's say you are hanging in nest box with ant problems. Here's what Lee Pauser had to say about this product. I prefer this can of it because it includes a brush. This is over Tanglefoot. Care must be taken to avoid applying it where a bird might come in contact with it. So I apply a band of it completely around the wire just below the hanger wires hook. Now remember, he's using this on hanging nest boxes. The band could be one half to one inch wide or so. It becomes less effective as the so surface hardens or enough ants get stuck in it to form a little bridge. It may need to be refreshed the next week. One also needs to be careful not to contact it when handling the box yourself as it is hard to clean off. Uh, screws often come in handy. Sometimes you need to find a longer screw or a place one that just isn't holding the box close, closed anymore, or the nest box is loose and needs to be tightened up. And plastic bags, big or small, often become useful when something needs to be held onto for some reason. Uh, small plastic containers can be used to hold onto grass. They can be used to reconstruct nests that get wet or for some other reason just won't work anymore. And you will no doubt collect other items for your trail, like hammers, stakes, wire, extra nest boxes, but these are the essentials to get you started. Now, a lot of people start off with the idea of putting a nest box in their yard. That may or may work, and it may not. Um, it usually takes at least an acre of grassland to make good hunting grounds for a western bluebird nest, and more if we're talking about the mountain bluebird family. Your lawn might get hunted by bluebirds, but it may take more territory to really do it for them. A schoolyard across the fence, for example, would absolutely provide a good source of food. It's just a matter of how much food is available. If you see bluebirds in your yard, by all means, put up a bluebird house. If you see them nearby, put up a bluebird house. If you never see them or you can tell that there isn't a native plant within a quarter mile of your house, Maybe your backyard isn't the best place for a nest box. But then again, there are backyards that have no bluebirds, but they do have other cavity nesting birds hoping for your assistance. If you think this might be you, let us know and we'll see what was going on. Native plants are the key to success in a backyard nest. Not just what is in your yard, but what is nearby. So let's say you live in an apartment or you know your backyard is not a good place for a nest box. Look at the park nearby or other open space. You can set up a nest box trail. A nest box trail is a string or strings of nest boxes. I have a nest box trail with three lines of nest boxes, including bluebird boxes, chickadee boxes, barn owl boxes, American kestrel boxes at a, a county park near my house. Uh, well, it's not near my house anymore, but it was. Um, and don't just put up nest boxes on public property. Get permission. The way you do this is to find out who controls it, who controls the land, and go to them and ask. They are actually kind of used to people making requests like this. They'll have questions for you, and we can usually help you through the process. And by the way, county parks, city parks, and even utility districts have volunteer groups. Joining volunteer groups like this may make the job of setting up nest box trails on land control by that agency easier. One question they often ask is what kind of birds might nest in your nest box? Now I've made a big deal about the fact that birds need to be in your neighborhood to nest in your nest box. How could you possibly know? Well, here is an idea. eBird is an app and website that allows you to find birds and birders that birders have found in your neighborhood. It is popular and getting better and better known and used. You can see what cavity nesting birds are common near your house. And if you're looking at a park or other open space, the birders may well be birding there. When you set up a nest box trail, know what species to expect and install boxes that use the preferences we know each target species prefers. And this is where, for example, the personal coaching that Georgette is offering um, will come in because we can op often tell what kind of birds just by looking at the trees and the, the other vegetation around 
we can tell what you might be able to expect there. And we know how to go to eBird and look and see what, uh, what birds are seen there. So we can tell when, a, when there's hope for a bird using your nest box and when there's no hope for a bird using your nest box. So in summary, when you are setting up a nest box trail, consider the habitat, the canopy, tree species, birds seen in the area, pesticides, human activity, construction, purchase for hunting, and safe entry for parents. So there are a few ways to mount your nest box. Let's go over them and discuss the pros and the cons of each. So pole mounted nest boxes are probably the preferred method of mounting a nest box if it's available to you. It isn't always. For example, it isn't available to me on my trail in my county park. Installing a pole is considered development, believe it or not, and it takes a CEQA process, including getting community comment over a number of weeks to install them. That being said, they should be considered. Installation can involve quite a process, such as using an auger like this one. These can dig a good pole hole pretty fast, but remember to check with the utilities to be sure you aren't going to hit a gas line or something. Or you can just start the hole using a shovel or a post hole digger. And frankly, you may not even need any of this if the ground is soft, for, like right after rains. These fence post drivers are, good, are a good way to drive the pole into the ground. If the ground is soft enough, you probably won't even need to start with an auger or a shovel. And look at the conduit clamp in the middle of this pole. This is a good way to secure the box to the pole. U-bolts can also do the job. Notice that the conduit clamp is screwed into the, onto the, into the floor. Um, and notice that Tim McClintock here, our uh, monitor, is drilling into the pipe, the pole, uh, and through the wood so he can put a bolt through that will hold the box to the pole in one place. You can also drill through the clamp to the pole. The pole here is actually electrical conduit. There are a number of ways to attach the box to the pole. Some of Tim's boxes have track rails. Track rails have parts that allow the box to be clamped to the pole. Now, how about uh, the pole, the pros of using this? They're easy to put in and move around. Um, they're easier to put in than they are to move. Um, the nice thing is you can put them wherever you want. You can put them exactly how far away from a tree uh, or a bush or something like that you want. You can put them exactly where you want. Once you put them in, you can move them by, by uh, going in and removing all of the, the parts and then moving the, the pole back and forth. You can imagine it's not that easy to pull the pole out, but it can be done. Um, and then it is compatible with the stovepipe baffle and the knoll guard. This, um, now the, the knoll guard can be used on many different kinds of, of boxes, but the stovepipe baffle can only be used on pole mounted nest boxes. They're not as vulnerable to predators um, as uh, post mounted or tree mounted nest boxes. And most, uh, they're most safe across the nation. What I mean by that is if you were gonna go be Johnny nest box across the nation and putting up nest boxes everywhere, and you were trying to find a nice safe place to put nest boxes everywhere, this would be your best bet if you could only use one particular way to mount the nest boxes. The cons, they're not always an option. That, that's really the biggest con. So then we come to post-mounted boxes. And installation of a post-mounted box is actually really, really easy. All you have to do is have a battery-operated drill driver and screws. And then you literally just screw through the bottom of the nest box you see there into the post. And it's easy to move them because, well, that's, that's one of the pros. It's easy to move because let's say something happens here, um, they get hit by a snake. I'm gonna tell you uh, about moving the nest box is often one of the best responses you can have to predation. And you can easily move post-mounted nest boxes simply by remove, you know, back out the screws and move them to a different post and screw them back in again. Um, so that's one of the, the biggest pros and they may be your only option. For example, for me, these are my only option. I'm not supposed to put them on trees. I could put them in trees on high, hanging boxes, 
but um, but I I'm not supposed to put them on poles, and I'm uh, not supposed to actually screw them into trees, as you will see us use elsewhere. So in this case, it's pretty much my only option. And then uh, the cons, they're very vulnerable to predators. In fact, uh, we, we sometimes have people who really know their, their way around monitoring nest boxes. And if they saw me talking about uh, post-mounted nest boxes or the next one, which is tree-mounted nest boxes, um, their jaws would drop and they'd be very unhappy with me. But here's the thing, sometimes uh, it is, like I said, the only way that, for example, a park might allow you to do it. So if that's the case, then maybe that's what you have to do. Tree-mounted nest boxes. Now, the installation of tree-mounted nest boxes is pretty much the same as with the pole-mounted nest box. As you can see, installation is pretty much just screw in using a battery-operated drill driver. Um, so installation is easy. Moving them is easy. Um, and uh, so that's the, the big pros and the cons. And they may be your only option. For example, at golf courses. Now, golf courses do not like the idea of pole-mounted nest boxes because they have to mow all the time. They don't like the idea of uh, post-mounted, it's not, not that they don't like the idea of post-mounted nest boxes, they don't have posts. And uh, so uh, and, and they're okay with actually hanging nest boxes but um, that's not always going to be uh, available to the, uh, the nest box monitor. So there are going to be times when, and not to mention the fact that uh, uh, their big con, which is they're vulnerable to predators, one of those big predators is snakes. And one thing about golf courses is they have very low grass. So snakes don't feel comfortable crawling through the grass. You go to my county park, the grass could be, you know, up to your, uh, up to your hip. And uh, so they have no problem crawling around there, but in a golf course, not so much. So they're going to be a lot safer, especially if you use a null guard, even though it's on a tree. The hanging nest box. Now I've got a couple of different kinds of retrievers to show you. This is using a retriever to put the nest box onto a tree branch. The way that this one, I'm using a basket style retriever on this nest box and uh, you lift up on it, pull it down and you pull it and then uh, we'll get a chance to see the chickadees that are using this. Um, so as you can see, this is under the canopy of the, uh, the tree that it's a little cooler under there. It's very comfortable for the nest box, uh, the occupants of the nest box, right? Um, those, so those little chickadees. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of birds that like to nest under the canopy. Um, bluebirds have no problem nesting under the canopy, but there are other, other birds that really prefer to nest under the canopy. The pros of using a hanging nest box are that they are not as vulnerable to predators in California. Um, if uh, I, I've had conversations with my friends who nest, who check their nest boxes in Louisiana, and they are shocked, I tell you, to hear that we use hanging nest boxes in our trees. Because over there, they have a lot of uh, tree climbing snakes that are just crawling through their, their trees looking for things to eat. Here, our biggest snake problem is the gopher snake. And yes, unfortunately, I do have at least one uh, video of a snake inside a nest box that was hanging in a tree, but it's not very common. It's uh, it's actually pretty rare. So they, um, these hanging nest boxes are considered fairly safe from um, from various uh, kind of uh, predators. They're not perfectly safe. That it's not like like nothing ever is ever able to get to them. But um, they are a little bit. They are less vulnerable than the post mounted and the tree mounted for sure. Uh, they are excellent for many bird species, as I said, the so chickadees tip mice um, and uh, wet, uh, the nuthatches, things like that. They all prefer tree mounted, uh, the, the ones that are hanging in the nest box. Um, the white person nuthatch actually likes to have it close to the, uh, close to the trunk. So um, they're good with hanging nest boxes, but they don't want to fly all the way out. So um, there is that. Uh, as global climate change worsens, the, the cooling effects of the canopy is going to help a lot of our birds. So 
Um, although bluebirds and tree swallows are good with nesting out from under the canopy as things get hotter and hotter, it's gonna start making them more successful if they're under canopy. Um, and then it keeps nest boxes away from vandals. And the reason this is important is because, for example, at my county park, uh, where I have my hanging nest boxes, the reason I have them there is because there are a lot of picnic areas and um, picnic areas mean little kids running around with nothing to do, looking for trouble. And if they find a nest box at their level, they're liable to do something to it, like bang on it or knock on it or things like that, bug the birds, not let them feed their young. Uh, whereas uh, if it's up in the nest box, up in the tree, um, it's going to be a lot safer from them. These are two different kinds of uh, nesting nest box retrievers. So the hook style is very easy to make. You get a, uh, a swimming pool pole, the, the kind they use for, uh, for having nets that you use in the pool. Just get the pole itself. And then you get a hook that is the style that has, that you can put a nut on both sides. And then you just go ahead and fit, put that, that the two nuts on and you're in, that's it. That's, that's the whole retriever. Um, the basket style, as you can imagine, is a lot more intricate. And there are different kinds. I showed you a wire style basket retriever. Um, we have also used wooden style retrievers, which are much heavier. And um, we no longer, um, you don't really see them in use anymore. Um, so, uh, the, and the thing about these is that they could be kind of heavy. Um, you need to have a certain amount of upper body strength in order to use them. So um, the, the hook style of retriever, um, the way that it hangs off um, can be a little bit more daunting. And the way you deal with that is just make sure it don't hang it too high up. So for example, 12 feet. I have some nest boxes that are 17 feet up. You don't need to do that. You could go ahead and just hire, have them so that they're basically out of the way of uh, mischievous kids. And once you do that, um, then, then that should be fine. Even though the pole mounted, but make sure and try these things out. Um, if uh, you can ask us if you are nowhere near Cupertino, but if you live near Cupertino, you can always go and try our nest box retriever over there and see what you think, or and go ahead and talk to us and we'll, we'll try and figure out something for you. These retrievers are kind of one of the keys to dealing with uh, hanging nest boxes. This is a, the, the hook style retriever being used, um, as you can see. And uh, now that brings us to why keep data? Why you keep data is because you can't remember everything that happens. Um, and you want to learn and study from what you find. You want to keep notes week by week, notes of repairs needed, number of eggs, the presence of hatchlings, bird, bird IDs, bird species, and things like that. And when you go the next week, it's really nice to be able to refer to what you saw last week. I guarantee you, unless you have a really good memory, and I certainly don't, um, it's nice to be able to refer to your notes so you know what to expect when you come in here. And you want to know when you open up and there's an empty box, you're like, weren't there eggs here last week? You want to be able to refer to your notes so you know what was there last week. Um, this will assist you with... Uh, knowing where in the nesting cycle each nest box is. And forms are available online or you can just keep good notes. Here we go, download the app. This is Citizen Science. Um, so Nest, nest Watch is something run by Cornell and they have an app that allows you to uh, really GPS locate all of your nest boxes. Um, and they, have, uh, they can give you nest and egg identification help and they have uh, nest box plans and tips on their, on their website. And they ask that you report to them every week. So during the nesting season, you report every week. So that's the way, the style of reporting they ask for is every week. So, um, so that's one thing you can do. And then here's our website. We also ask you for your data. Um, we do things a little bit differently. Uh, we ask for everything reported annually. Um, and we ask for the number of nests, eggs, hatchlings, and fledglings of each species. We maintain, it, we maintain an email list that will notify you of data entry information and events 
um, you know, how we'll, we'll tell you how to go about entering the data. Of course, it's also available on our website and things like that. So why would you want to give your data to CBRP? Well, your data tells us how effective our program is and where more attention could be given. It's our best tool to know which nest box trails are active and which might need new monitors. The data can be used to spot troubling trends in cavity nesting bird populations, especially in California. Now, I've mentioned our nest box monitor, Lee Pauser, several times, and he was actually talking to the people at Cornell and using our data, he was able to show them that trees, tree swallows in California were struggling this last season. That's something that not even Cornell was aware of. And late season rains, winds, climate change can all affect uh, bluebirds and other cavity nesting bird populations. Bluebirds are an indicator species, and these can all be studied through our data. As global warming gets worse, we can learn what works and what doesn't work by studying our data. We have data for all the different counties in California and even down to the trails. So challenges, at this point, it may sound like I've covered some pretty negative stuff and the challenges section is even more. But much of the stuff that I will tell you on challenges is actually kind of rare. I have to say that most of them have happened to me once to either Georgette or I over the decade or more that we've both been monitoring. But many of them, I have never experienced and many of them, neither has Georgette. I like being really thorough in my training sessions, but I don't want you to think, wait a minute, what am I getting myself into? The truth is the rewarding part of finding eggs and baby birds is the thing that happens every single week. And the unfortunate discoveries, they happen infrequently. With that being said, let's talk about some of the stuff that you might find on the trail and what you can do about it. So one of the most common predators that we find is the gopher snake. Uh, I'm showing you a photo of a gopher snake in a nest box, but let me be frank that it is not what you like or what you will find in the vast majority of snake attacks. This is, the snakes hit and run. And let me point out that snakes are something that can be relatively abundant in some places and they just aren't elsewhere. I mentioned that they don't like hanging around golf courses for example, Georgette has no problems with snakes at all. Many manicured golf courses or cemeteries or places like that don't have hiding places for snakes. My county park with its hiking trails does have snakes and I need to plan accordingly. So what one of the best responses to snake predation is to move the box. Snakes, like many predators, get educated the first time they find, a nest, find food in a nest box, for example, chicks. They learn where to find a meal and they may return in a couple of weeks, hoping to find more. By moving the nest box, you kind of reset it. I mentioned null guards and stovepipe baffles. Use these if, you are, if they are available to you as a deterrent to snakes. And raccoons. Now I had a raccoon attack once on my nest boxes, once. Raccoons are clever and strong. They can rip a nest box apart. That is what happened to my nest boxes. Yes, I lost two boxes to raccoons. And I've actually heard of other raccoon attacks where even more nest boxes were hit all in one night. Um, that is what happened to my nest boxes. Um, and I said they were smart. And sadly, of the raccoon attacks I've heard about, they usually seem to hit more than one box. Make your nest boxes nice and sturdy. Now, this is a screenshot from a video of a raccoon hitting a nest box. This raccoon has entirely too much of his arm in this box. And I have to assume that perhaps it was a slot box or the entrance was too big. Raccoon attacks are very rare. So I would suggest making sure that the entrance hole on your nest box is no larger than it has to be. That the nest box is made sturdy and then just assume that it will not happen. And when it does, you can ask us for ideas on how to respond. Um, as I said, ma making um, your nest boxes, they don't look exactly alike is one thing you can do. Another is to, um, to move them after they've been attacked or even pull down some of the nest boxes in the areas where they get hit hardest and leave them all down for a couple of years uh, before you put them back up again. European paper wasps are usually found in boxes that are left in the full sun. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that you usually find them there. I mean, if you find them, 
that's usually where the box was. Um, you can rub a bar of soap along the box ceiling and they will have trouble affixing their comb to the ceiling, which is what they usually like to do. The other idea I have for you is to be sure you have good ventilation along the top of the box. Wasps don't like ventilation along the top of that box. And I actually kind of hope you have this problem. Bumblebees, they're native pollin pollinators and they're struggling. They do sometimes build nests in our nest boxes, especially liking old chickadee nests, which are very soft. Now, I'm always glad to see bumblebees because it's a sign of a healthy ecosystem. And you can put up another nest box for the birds. Um, they may be there for the rest of the nesting season. They may move on when it's over. Honeybees are very rarely a problem, but if they are, you could just wait to see if they're still there the next week. And they sometimes swarm in nest boxes on a very temporary basis. If they linger, you can call in one of your bee people to remove them. Ants can be a problem. I've already discussed some solutions. The little Argentine ants have been known to hang around harmlessly in the nest box. When I find them all over the nestlings, it's never been really clear that the ants were the real problem, or maybe they were just there to scavenge when they found nestlings that were already dead from something else. Fire ants are another story. Fire ants and certain other large ant species can be more harmful. If ants are a problem, in addition to using diatomaceous earth or tanglefoot, you're gonna also want to move the box. And I've never had a real problem with parasites or blowflies. Unfortunately, they seem to be an issue that you may never really know about as a nest box monitor because it is something the birds have to deal with independently. Thus, what I can say is that you should always clear out those old nests when you find them to prevent parasites from re reproducing in the nest. These wire platforms are supposed to be uh, there to prevent blowflies, but I've never had a problem with blowflies. So this is a big state and what isn't a problem in one location may be a problem somewhere else. So if blowflies are an issue uh, for you, look at using these wire platforms. You ever have so, problems with bugs, blowflies, stuff like that? We have had one incident of blowflies and the blowfly uh, larvae will kill the baby bluebirds if they get attached to them sometimes. And I've had, uh, but only once in several years, had to actually pick the little larvae off. Because usually what happens is you get there too late and they're already dead, to yeah. be honest, once it gets an infestation. But in general, we've had a very, like one infestation that I know of. So corvids and hawks. Corvids are like jays, um, like the scrub jay. Birds like this can try and peek in and get a nestling. To combat this, Use predator guards as you can and remove old nests so the birds don't have to build new nests on top of the old ones. Um, and I've already talked about house sparrows. We have advice on house sparrows on our website, tbrp.org. Um, so, uh, and I think I've, uh, I've talked about uh, house sparrows earlier. Now, under getting started, uh, uh, if you look at under getting started right here and then go to nest box monitoring, that takes you into our training page. And the house sparrow information is towards the bottom. And there's actually a lot of other information there too, by the way. Um, we've actually put a lot of information on our web website, including uh, a lot of the training that I'm giving you. I'm, it's actually there in text form, along with, you know, various other uh, videos and photos. Um, and then house wrens. Now, house wrens are a bit different mainly because they are native birds. Unlike house sparrows, house wrens are protected by law, but they're a jealous little bird and they could be uh, really uh, hard on any other bird trying to nest nearby. Um, so, for example, if you have a bluebird nesting nearby in another nest box, the house wren may come and poke holes in the eggs. Um, they don't kill adult birds like the house sparrows, but it can be very frustrating to work with them. Um, if you see this, uh, all these sticks, that's the hallmark of a house wren nest. Um, and house wrens also will build dummy nests in, uh, in uh, any um, cavity that is near 
their nest. So they will try and keep all the other birds away from them. And uh, so that's why if you know you're in house rent territory, you need to be kind of careful. Um, the way I'd like you to, to work on it is put a, uh, a nice box in their territory with a very small entrance so that um, chances are only the house rents will use it and then get everybody else away from the thickets, away from the house rent territory and try and put them out so that the uh, house rents don't become a problem for them. And then woodpeckers. Now, woodpeckers are not, I mean, frankly, I like having woodpeckers in my nest box. Um, the, uh, now, I've got a couple of pine nest boxes. Uh, I didn't actually deliberately build them. They were built by some scouts who uh, showed up and, and gave them to me. And so I put them into use. And it turns out that the soft wood of pine is really something that the woodpeckers really liked. And so not only did they open up the nest boxes like they often do, they actually nested in them. So if you like, uh, if you like woodpeckers, use pine nest boxes. Um, we don't get that many woodpeckers in our nest boxes, um, but they do uh, cause quite a bit of havoc on some of our nest boxes. I see kind of a little bit of a woodpecker haven. You can see they've modified this box. So it just happens that I work in a violin shop that I can put a thin piece of one of these on and this see, would be the right hole here. This is a bluebird size and this is a chickie box. Why do you need to put the piece? Well see how the woodpeckers have picked that hole? It's, yeah. See how it's the hole's not the right size yeah. anymore. Oh, it's only can... supposed to be an inch and a quarter on these boxes. Oh, and that's definitely not an inch and a quarter. That's more like an inch and a half. And so I have these protectors of different sizes here. Verify that. Yeah, there's a smaller one. So this is one I want. This dude. Okay, so first we'll drill a couple of holes. Oh, I like it. I don't have to worry about drilling a hole into this because it's soft, but this hardwood, there's no way to get us getting a screw through that would be quite a bit. That's why we have the drill. Like, no, I'm not, because then it's oh, easier yeah. for the the predators, oh, okay. and it's just not the right size. And also, um, so, uh, that's why we do this. And... Now, um, a couple things. First of all, he mentioned that he worked at a violin shop and the rest of that story was the fact that they have like uh, wood that they were getting rid of um, that was uh, kind of um, the uh, what was left after they were done making their violins. And uh, he, it turned out that the hardwood that they used for the violins made really good uh, um, wood to make holes in and use as uh, protectors against woodpecker damage. If I told you about protectors, they were metal and they're shaped the same way. And you can use those also. That, that's the whole, the whole point. And, and of course, you need to have really short screws so that you don't go poking into the nest box. You don't want sharp points sticking out at the bottom there. So make sure and have screws that are the right way. Um, I don't generally use really narrow uh narrow um, wood if you can help it but unfortunately on hanging nest boxes you kind of got to do that if you're going to be using a basket style retriever and i use a basket style retriever so um anyway uh the uh so he all another thing he mentioned was that the entrance hole had been opened from an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half and remember i mentioned the bluebirds like an inch and a half but the thing is that uh that most of the birds in this area where this is being done are chickadees and wrens and titmice and shut nut hatches and things like that. All of them like an inch and a quarter hole. And if you use an inch and a quarter hole, that means you exclude house sparrows for one. Um, and, and you, you actually do exclude bluebirds as well. But if you put up a few birds, a few boxes for the bluebirds, few boxes for the chickadees and things like that, 
then everybody gets uh, gets a little something that they need. Um, but in this case, oddly enough, it had opened it up to the point where the, the bluebirds can get in there and know he wants to go and close it back down. So um, anyway, I just thought that was a, a neat video to show you. And like I said, Tex Houston, our former Santa Clara County coordinator. Um, and then mice, rats, and squirrels. Now, I don't have a problem with squirrels, um, but I was told I should go ahead and include it. They are rodents, obviously. Um, squirrels don't usually get into our uh, regular nest boxes if the entrance hole size is correct. But, um, but they theoretically, they could. And uh, now, mice and wood rats is a different story because mice and wood rats, um, I should say deer mice. Deer mice and wood rats are both native species of rodents. And so as such, and by the way, in my county park, um, I, I couldn't get rid of them if I wanted to. That, that's just the way it is. Uh, it's a county park. You can't go in there and just kill things like that. So um, they, uh, they are allowed to take at least some of my boxes. Now, Lee Pauser actually has developed a kind of a, a device that he puts up on top of the nest box. I need to make sure it's on, the, on, the, uh, on our website. Um, the idea is it kind of is like, if you ever seen the things where, you know, you, if you're a mouse and you land on top of the hanging nest box and you kind of flip off, um, it's just kind of, it's just basically a little platform and the platform is real unsteady in it. And, uh, and if you land on it as you're falling from the, the tree branch, you go careening right off of it. They're fine. They're, they're not going to, if they land on the ground, they'll be fine. Um, and so the thing about deer mice and wood rats is they are the bottom of the food chain. They're important. So not only, uh, so when, when I tell you that I can't get rid of them, I wouldn't want to get rid of them even if I could. So um, I just figure that it's a reason to have lots of nest boxes up at my trail so that the mice and the rats, now unfortunately mice and rats can be carnivorous. So you want to make sure that, um, that there are nest boxes they can't get into. Um, cats are a challenge because they uh, they obviously are they kill a lot of a lot of wildlife, right? Um, this is my uh, my old cat that was trying to tell us why we can't have clean laundry. But um, when you have uh, cats in the neighborhood, make sure. And I think I may have already said this, but keep your nest boxes um, away from anything that will allow them to jump on top of them. Um, uh, keep them away from fences, away from, from trees and things like that. So the, uh, the cats can't get on top and you may even want to put spikes up on top of the roof. Um, and then bats. Now, this is actually uh, something, another case that I hope you have, because frankly, bats are important to us. Um, they eat mosquitoes and things like that. We're making a big mistake by not really trying to help our bats. And, and you know, this whole thing, this whole scare about them giving diseases and things like that. Obviously, rabies is not something to be taken lightly. And I am not asking you to go and start petting that bat. bat. When you see that bat, close the box back up, stay away from it, okay? Um, it will, chances are it will be gone the next time you open it up. But, um, but if you see a bat like that, then what you want to do is put up a bat house nearby. They, there are actual bat structures that you can use to give them a place to live. Because the reason this bat is here is because you couldn't find any, anywhere better to go. And um, so we need bats. And this is a sign of a healthy, healthy ecosystem. So, you know, don't shoo it away because if you send it out in the daylight, it could be, it could be uh, curtains for it because then it could get caught by a falcon or something. So just leave it where it is. Give, and, and chances are it'll be gone the next time you see it. Then soiled nests. Um, I mentioned the little um, plastic cup. You want to carry that around so you can uh, carry grass. And then you can. Uh, you may have to kind of replace an old nest that uh, maybe got really soaked up or something with water. This is, uh, has to do with mortality. And mortality is sad, but it, it happens. Um, why would uh, you lose an entire nest of, um, of babies? Of course, uh, pesticides used nearby is one where the babies all got poisoned. Or heat or cold. Um, you will generally know if 
the it's you know super super freezing out there or if it's super super hot um and unfortunately it may not be the uh, well it, it may not be the nest box that's the problem maybe the the food source so the food source crashed and that might be the heat or the cold or it could be just that the uh you know things got too hot inside the nest box or too cold inside the nest box um and then of course if uh, one of the parents gets uh, killed then that's going to be a problem because the other one may not be able to keep up so that's when you start finding uh say a uh um a dead one week old and a dead two week old and a dead you know two two week and a little bit you know um that's it's uh the kind of a little progression progressive deaths um anyway cleaning and repairing remember that your nest box this is a video that was done remember that your nest box gets used during the winter for roosting that's what these guys are doing they're trying to keep warm by uh getting all together and huddling okay um so during the winter you would go and you would Check the integrity of the roof for water tightness. You repair any woodpecker damage, and, um, and then you plug up the vents for roosting, um, so to keep things a little bit warmer in there. And uh, if you think things need to be kind of cleaned out, you can use a 10% bleach solution. You spray in the box and let it dry thoroughly. Don't don't um, don't. Uh, so I I would if I was going to use a bleach solution, I'd leave that door open. Um, for some time so that the bleach will dry off because we don't want to asphyxiate the uh, birds. And that brings us to the end of our training. I'll be back in a minute with a few more ideas for you, but Georgette is here to talk about some resources I think you'll find interesting. So the first resource here is uh, the California Bluebird Recovery Program website. And Tricia Jordan, our wonderful website uh, uh, designer and she she manages our website plus she's a board member put all of this information online for you guys so you can refer to it mike and i wrote all the the copy um, um but uh, she put it all in for us monitoring your bluebird trail in california by hatch graham is a booklet that is available on the web, web website and what's good about that it was written um gosh, in the late 90s, and it's still applicable. Um, it's basic monitoring uh, techniques. And also he talks about many of the birds that will use your nest boxes. And then we are affiliates of the North American Bluebird Society. And there's uh, fact sheets on there available for you. And, uh, you know, it, it's also a good source of information. And we also have www cialis.org it's a comprehensive guide for everything bluebird um, it's pretty it's pretty amazing the bluebird monitors guide is excellent i used that when i first uh, started monitoring and uh, has a beautiful pictorial in there about eastern bluebird uh, babies and how you know every single day it's documented and some great tips in there the bluebird book by the stokes another a uh, very good general information book and has a lot about behavior in there, which I think is always very interesting. Mountain bluebirds. Uh, if any of you have mountain bluebirds, uh, Myrna Pearman is the expert on uh, mountain bluebirds. And uh, she's a retired biologist at Ellis Bird For Farm in Alberta, Canada. And uh, she is the one to turn to if you want to learn more about mountain bluebirds. She also wrote another book just recently, which we were very grateful to be able to contribute to. If you have youngsters, I'll be using this book for my Eagle Scout candidates. We work with them often. I'm actually good for any age because she covers just about everything that we covered in, in these classes for new monitors. Bringing Nature Home and uh, The Nature of Oaks by Doug Ptolemy. He is a professor and an entomologist who's really opened up the conversation nationally about planting natives in your backyards um, and in common spaces and how we can restore 
huge swaths of habitat just by doing that. And so if you're interested, you know, those, those are great reads. So those are some great resources, and I want to give you a few more and go into a bit more detail. In part one, I mentioned UC IPM, a wonderful resource, not just for the agencies we hope you will get away from using pesticides in your neighborhood, but also for you. How do you get pests out of your garden safely? UC IPM will give you answers. I did give you the address for eBird, but since I'm giving out information anyway, let me do that again. eBird is a great resource, and if you have questions about how to use it, let us know, and if we find too many people asking us questions about it, we'll make a video. Uh, we also have a Facebook page that allows us to share the good and the bad of our fight for survival of wildlife habitat. We look at environmental heroes, trumpet our great ideas, and of course share pictures of bluebirds and other cavity nesting birds. A quick reminder that all the topics we just talked about are also discussed on our website, cbrp.org. Quickly, I'd like to point out the Getting Started menu. This is a great place to start. The Getting Started menu gives you three places to go, Trail, Monitor, and Report. All three of these have much information we've discussed in this training in text format with photos. You will recognize a lot of the topics here from the topics covered during these two sessions. Let me point out to the left hanging boxes item we give you a good long look at hanging nest boxes because here in California, they really are considered an important method of mounting boxes. But more importantly above that, you will find nest box and retriever plans. That takes you to a page with even more information on all the retrievers, how to make them, how to make the nest boxes, and it even comes with a video from Lee Pauser himself explaining how they should be used. Okay, so if we go to back up to the top, next to getting started, you'll find the resources menu item. And the resources menu item is going to take us to a bunch of resources that uh, are really good. Um, and one of the first ones I'll mention is uh, the Cialis.org that we've already talked about. But what I want to emphasize is that we haven't really covered house sparrows as much as we really maybe should have because in some places house sparrows can be a real problem you need to know what to do when you find house sparrows in your nest boxes and uh, what are some tips and tricks you can use to maybe prevent them from going to the nest boxes how you can uh, uh, try and keep them away um, and things like that it's it's a very important subject that we didn't necessarily give the uh, best amount of attention if you have any other questions, of course, you can always contact us and ask us more. And below that, uh, you will find uh, a, an item. Remember, we mentioned Hatch Graham. Uh, it's down here under resources. It's uh, one of the lists. So that's the middle red arrow. And the bottom red arrow is another gateway to get to that nest box and retriever construction plants I just talked about. Record and report results has some information we've heard during the lesson Why Keep Data, including more information on how to report to CBRP and Cornell Nest Watch. We've told you that tracking forms are available on our website, and here they are. There are three different forms. You can decide for yourself which one is the most appropriate for you. And you may have noticed that I use some four-letter abbreviations for different birds. You can find out those abbreviations at, by just looking at this item here. We've talked about personal coaching, so let me tell you exactly what that is. After years of monitoring nest boxes, we've developed a sense of what birds will be found in which neighborhoods. Using tools like eBird, Google Earth, and your photos, along with a plant inventory, we can figure out what your backyard nest box, if it has any shot of being used by native birds. And if so, how to install it for maximum benefit. We can guide you through the process of contacting management agencies and setting up your own nest box trail nearby in a park or something like that. Or if we know of nearby trails looking for a monitor, we can hook you up with that as well. I'm hoping that after all of this, you are either thinking about installing nest boxes somewhere or maybe in volunteering in some way. We might have a nest box monitor in your area who could be willing to let you tag along with them while they check their nest boxes, which is 
actually a fun idea because sometimes what happens is people uh, go on vacation and they're able to leave the people that walked their trail with them, have them do it for a week uh, in order to make sure somebody's there to monitor the, the boxes while they're gone. And you may have seen community events in your city or nearby that could give an opportunity to help spread the word. For example, our county coordinators sometimes show up at community events and they could always use someone to help them out um, in helping to spread the word. And of course, there are people who might be willing to build nest boxes for others, even if they don't personally have time to monitor themselves. If you're interested in any of this at all, have questions or anything else, please contact us at info at cbrp.org. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us and we hope to hear from you.